Well, I'm very excited to be here uh, to share with you some of the uh, exciting things we're, we're learning about the universe and also some of the mysteries that the young people in the audience are going to have to solve. And that for me is sort of the most exciting part because I remember when I was growing up, I didn't always appreciate that science was more than just the facts in the book that the book of science is not done. And so I'm gonna tell you about two big puzzles tonight that uh, probably uh, I'm not gonna be able to solve both of them, although I would like to. And so somebody in the audience is gonna have to take the baton and solve uh, uh, one, of, one of these mysteries. Okay, um, so the dark side of the universe. Uh, when we think of the universe, everybody thinks of billions and billions, right? It's really big. Uh, you know, billions of years old, billions of light years. And I'm, I'm going to try not to use those big numbers because it just gets everybody's head spinning. But um, what you do realize in the universe is that most of what we know about the universe, because it's so big, is not by having visited places, but by seeing the light. And so, you know, how could we know about the dark side of the universe? So I'm, I'm going to tell you about that. And I'm going to tell you that the dark side of the universe is the more interesting side. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about the light side of the universe. So does, hopefully people recognize this. Uh, and uh, hopefully people recognize that. The Hubble Space Telescope, that's a terrific instrument that's taught us a lot about the universe. And then people may recognize, how many people recognize this image? Um, <laughs> This is probably the most famous image in all of astronomy. It's called the Hubble Deep Field or the Hubble Point and Shoot. The Hubble stared in one direction for, I think, about 10 or 12 days. And uh, this is the picture that it took. So an exposure of 10 or 12 days. Um, and this answers the question, how far can you see on a clear Day. Although actually they were looking day and night, so you know. And this photo also, uh, this is a two billion dollar photo. Just because I know many of you are taxpayers. Uh, <laughs> and I just want to say it was worth every penny. Okay, so let me just tell you what you're seeing and then tell you what you're not seeing. So this is a tiny little bit of the sky. Uh, and I apologize, I'm not going to use too many numbers, but I do want to spin your heads a little bit, otherwise you won't think I'm a real scientist. Um, this is about one ten millionth of the sky. I mean, that's a really small part of the sky. And just to show you how small it is, I believe, uh, I have to look, there's one star here. So that's how small, it, and you know, the Hubble's very powerful, it's much more powerful than your eyes. The rest of the images in this uh, are other galaxies. So you know we live in the Milky Way galaxy. It's got, oh, I'm going to do numbers, 100 billion stars. And the universe, I'll do some more numbers here, has about 100 billion galaxies. And one way to prove it is I can set you to counting galaxies here. There are a few thousand galaxies here. And then you multiply by 10 million, and you get 100 billion, I hope. Uh, and if not, I'll just adjust one of the numbers to make it work. <laughs> and uh, the most interesting part of this picture are not the individual galaxies, and they are really, really interesting. Uh, in fact, I'm going to get hung up here because uh, uh, the reason you can't see any farther is not because the Hubble wasn't good enough. It's when you look out in space, you look back in time. And so when you look out really, really far, you eventually reach the point where the first stars and galaxies were forming, and you can't see beyond that, right? Because there's nothing to see. Things weren't lit up. And so uh, the fact that you can, th the fact that this is all that you can see, you've looked back to the time when galaxies are forming. And if you look carefully, and you, you can go on the web and look at this, some of these galaxies look like, you know, ordinary galaxies, nice spiral galaxies. And some of them look like what a young postdoc called train wrecks, because you're seeing galaxies being assembled. So there's so much science that's been done uh, with this image. But what I want to talk about is the space in between, the dark stuff, because that's, that's where it's really at. That's where most of the universe is. So I, I have my first uh, slide here. Um, now, you know, when you send your kids to Chicago, or maybe you send them to Miami, you know, you don't let the bright lights blind you to the big city. 
So in the universe, the dark side, and let me just point over here. So if we do a census of the universe, stars are one half of a percent. Uh, dark matter is about one third and dark energy is about two thirds. So uh, the first thing, let's go back to the first thing. So what you can see with your eye is only about a half a percent of the universe. So we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. It's really pretty and uh, it's really uh, interesting, but most of it is dark matter and dark energy and the two are different. There will be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> and so, you know, you can bet number one question is what's the difference between dark matter and dark energy? So that's one thing I want you to come away with. So. Uh, Dar the gravity of dark matter is what holds the universe together, is what holds things together like our own galaxy. Um, and the second one is dark energy. And uh, dark energy is actually uh, causing the expansion of the universe to speed up and pushing things apart. And dark energy, uh, are all your seat belts buckled? <laughs> Okay, so uh, dark energy actually has repulsive gravity, but I'll be explaining that later on. Um, okay, so the universe, the stars are really pretty. And, oh, I forgot in, in uh, the, my cover slide, in my first slide here, I reminded you of the famous Carl Sagan saying that we're made of star stuff. The stars and us are made out of the same kind of stuff. And that's really cool. Unfortunately, most of the universe is not made out of the same kind of stuff. Uh, and that's dark matter and dark energy. So, uh, good. Two things we're going to talk about. Uh, and what's wonderful about science is the characters uh, and also the stories. So science is a dynamic process. It's a human process. Um, it involves discovery. It involves the fog at the edge of discovery when you're trying to figure things out. And so I'm going to tell you these two stories. And also the, the thing that I said at the very beginning is not all of our stories are done. And some of our stories, these two stories, you know, have room for more people to be involved. And, and if I'm looking at all the young people here and trying to sell them here. So this is the guy that started the Dark Matter story. And his name is Fritz Zwicky. And this story starts in the 1930s. And he was a very, very smart guy. Um, and uh, he didn't, you know, nowadays he would be sent home from school with doesn't play well with others. And what he's actually doing here is describing what a spherical bastard is. Does anyone here know what a spherical bastard is? So that is a person that no matter what direction you approach them, they're a bastard. And uh, some people would have called him that. So he was, he was hard to get along with, but he was very, very smart, and he made an extremely important discovery about the universe. He discovered dark matter. And let me tell you how he did it. So this is not the Hubble Deep Field. This is not, uh, in fact, this is an enormous chunk uh, of the universe, and each dot is a galaxy, but it's not a picture of a galaxy, it's just a dot. And so if you kind of, if you look at this picture, the first thing you would say, if you're being a scientist, is you'd say, in a lot of places, I mean, the dots seem to be randomly distributed, and in a lot of places, you know, they're kind of the same number of dots in a circle I draw here and I draw here, but oh boy, look at all the dots there. And so this was discovered by Zwicky and others uh, that there are clusters of galaxies. And I wanted to show you this because Virgo is a really big cluster. I mean, look at that you know, you would have picked that out and said something interesting is going on there. And uh, this one I think is interesting too. I think this is Coma. Uh, are there any real astronomers here? Okay, good. Then I can just say any damn thing I want. That's Coma right there. And uh, uh, so there are places where you find a lot more galaxies and those are called clusters of galaxies. And Virgo is interesting. The reason it looks so darn big is it's close. It's the closest cluster. And by the way, we have been invited for membership in Virgo, and we can't turn it down. Virgo, we're being pulled into Virgo, and we are going to be a member of this cluster. And that's a whole other story. Um, so uh, membership is not optional. Um, so he, uh, oh, here's Coma. Coma is very, very beautiful. So several thousand galaxies. Let's see. So here was Coma right here. 
And then here, here it is uh, when you actually see the individual galaxies. And there's several thousand galaxies in this. So each one of these smudges is a galaxy. That, of course, is a star. Um, and he studied what's going on with these clusters. And so now we have the artist's rendition of the galaxies and the clusters. And what he discovered is, is the galaxies in these clusters are moving fast, thousands of kilometers per second. Um, uh, I should be able to translate that into miles per hour, but I've had a long day, so I won't try to do that. I don't want to hurt myself here. Uh, moving really, really fast and moving in random directions. And so the question that Zwicky asked himself is, what keeps this cluster from just dispersing? Right? If you just follow this, this galaxy should go over there and that one should go over there and that one should go and so on and so forth and then it's not there anymore. And we know the answer. The answer is very simple, and Zwicky knew the answer. It's gravity. It's what keeps our solar system together. We are moving, our planet is moving at 30 kilometers per second, but we don't, you know, the sun's gravity holds us in a nice orbit. And so the story here uh, should be very, very similar. It's a little more complicated. Uh, what Zwicky said is, I know how this works. Remember how smart he is? Uh, all the, gra the gravity of all the stars and all the galaxies uh, holds the cluster together. And what happens is it's a little more complicated than the solar system. Let's just follow this galaxy. So it moves like that. And ooh, it got really far out there. And along the way, the, all the gravity of all the stars is pulling it back. It gets pulled back. It falls in. Now it goes out the other side and then falls back in. So it's kind of a dance. Got it? And gravity is what holds it all together. Okay, everybody understand that? Uh, there's a small problem. And when he calculated the gravity of all the stars, it's not enough to hold the cluster together. And you might say, you know, is it kind of off just a little bit? Or is it kind of off like the federal budget? And uh, <laughs> it's kind of off like the federal budget. So uh, it's a factor of 100 off. And uh, so now, this is what's so exciting about science. So now comes the fun part, the guessing. How many people knew that guessing is an important part of science? How many people? Okay, good. You guys are better scientists than I was when I was young. So now comes the guessing. So one guess could be, and remember 1935, cosmology was very young. One guess could be is guess what? Clusters are not really held together. It's just ships passing in the night. Um, but Zwicky said, I don't think so. And we now know that that's not so. We see lots of clusters, uh, millions of them. And uh, he guessed that galaxies are held together by the gravity of stuff that you can't see. And in science, sometimes it's important to name things. And he called it dark matter. So what he said is that you can't see what's holding the cluster together is stuff that you can't see. It's dark matter. It has gravity. Okay. So now you, now you get it that, um, oh, um, we'll come back and try to figure out what the dark matter is. This is fun. So this is another NASA satellite called the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And now by statute at the University of Chicago, I'm required to tell you that uh, Four of NASA's great observatories are named after scientists from the University of Chicago. Did you all know that Hubble went to the University of Chicago? Okay. And Chandrasekhar was a professor at the University of Chicago for almost 50 years. And the X-ray observatory is named after him. So here is the coma cluster when you use a regular old telescope, when you use your eyes aided by a telescope. Here's the coma cluster if you have X-ray vision. Do you notice a difference between those two pictures? So here you might ask, so first of all, it's a false color picture. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's not that x-rays are purple or anything. It's just the intensity is represented on a color scale. And so here you see lots of galaxies. Here, well, maybe you see two or three. What you're really seeing is that the human eye uh, does not see that the cluster is filled with hot gas that emits x-rays. And in fact, most of the atoms 
that exist in a cluster of galaxies are in this hot gas. And you can't see it with your eyes. And so this is really, really fun. So the, um, I'm just going to get so many asides here. So, so the term dark matter is, or the term dark is relative. So if you don't have x-ray eyes, you can't see this matter. And it's dark. If you have x-ray eyes, it, it jumps right out at you. So actually what we discovered is that, these, that all clusters of galaxies are filled with hot gas and we can see it with the x-rays. So now you're going to say, okay, end of story, the dark matter is just the hot gas, right? Uh, let's see if I said this. Accounts for most of the atoms, but we're still a factor of six short. So now it's like a state budget. Uh, we're still a factor of six short in this accounting for the dark matter. So the, the gas is very important because there's much more gas than there are stars. So most of the atoms in the universe never formed stars. Okay. Um, so my provost at the University of Chicago was a lawyer, an extremely good lawyer. And this was the picture that uh, convinced him that dark matter really exists. So this is another Hubble photograph. And this one came for free. The first one was two billion and then the rest were like free. So this is a really good deal. And this is a cluster of galaxies and there's its phone number. So, you know, if you dial this on your, I don't care what kind of plan you have on your cell phone, this is gonna be, uh, this, you're gonna pay for this call. Um, so what you see here is a cluster of galaxies those are the orange ones, and you've seen a bunch of galaxies, so they look like galaxies. And what you also see are these faint blue things. Do you see those? And guess what they're called? Faint blue galaxies. There we go. You could be an astronomer. And, uh, but there's something funny. So let me tell you a little bit about the faint blue galaxies. So you have to take this um, on my word, although I could prove it because in science you never take anyone's word. You always have to go out and measure yourself. But um, since we want to finish in time, we, you guys can't go out and measure. Um, the faint blue galaxies are way far away. They're much farther away than the cluster. And the light from the faint blue galaxies to get to us has to pass through the cluster. Um, and the gravity of the cluster bends the light. That's something that Einstein told us. In fact, probably some of you know that the Big, the first big success of Einstein's general relativity was the bending of, of starlight that was measured by Sir Arthur Eddington, and you'll meet him a little bit later. Um, and so what happens is uh, when you bend light, a lens bends light, right? And so we call this gravitational lensing, and actually we could have done it, uh, actually we'll do it afterwards. Um, so the, the cluster acts like a gravitational lens, and so uh, it creates multiple images. So these ring-like galaxies, they're all the same. It's the image of the same galaxy. It, dis it shears, it stretches and distorts the images of other galaxies. So it acts like a lens. It's a very funny lens. And you can make one afterwards by going and getting one of those wine glasses and breaking the top off. No, go ahead and do it. Ken said it's okay. And, uh, and then the bottom that's shaped like that if you, if you have some pictures of galaxies at home, uh, put that over it and you'll see these same kind of patterns. So that's a do at home. But you, remember, grab the glass out here before you leave. Okay. Um, so what, what you can do is, um, because we know how gravity bends light, we can take the multiple images and the distorted galaxies and turn it into a map of the dark matter. So we can map the dark matter. And so this is the, the uh, two directions on the sky. Let me just go back, that direction and that direction. And then up and down is how much mass at that position on the sky. And these sharp spiky things that your eyes pick out right away um, are the galaxies. And so you might say, where the heck is the dark matter? Because these things are so pretty to look at. Can everyone see this OK? Do, okay, good. So we don't need to turn down the lights? or Okay, good. As long as you can see it well. The dark matter, so these spiky things are very impressive and it proves the technique is able to sh detect the galaxies, but the dark matter is the smooth stuff and there's lots of it. So I could go on and on about dark matter 
and we have lots of different proofs of it. But uh, no one really paid attention to dark matter um, until Vera Rubin brought the problem closer to home. So this is Vera Rubin, um, a very famous astronomer, uh, and we're now uh, fast forwarding to the 1970s, although we um, did a little bit of stuff after the 1970s. And she showed that galaxies uh, like uh, our own Milky Way, and probably many of you recognize that image of Andromeda, which is our partner uh, a nearby galaxy, uh, that they're filled with dark matter. And the way she did this uh, was very, very clever, and it made people believe in dark matter. So here we have a galaxy. Galaxies are made of hundreds of billions of stars. The stars are actually orbiting on very simple orbits uh, around the uh, center of the galaxy. So the galaxy is kind of like a giant solar system. So all of the uh, stars, like our sun, uh, moves around the center of the galaxy at about uh, 240 kilometers per second. And uh, so let's suppose that uh, galaxies were all the stars. Um, and so that produces a certain uh, gravitational field. And what she did was mapped out the speeds of stars as a function of their position from the center of the galaxies. And so this is called a rotation curve. It's a technical term, and, and the, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that the rotation curve is flat. So the, the stars that you can't really see here and the gas clouds that have been mapped out are moving, that are way far away from where, where all the uh, visible matter is, are moving just as fast as the ones that are nearby. And I think all of you know that gravity when you get farther away from an object, the gravity decreases. So that should immediately ring a bell that something is not right here because, you know, the gravitational field of the, of the star produced by the stars in the galaxy out here is much weaker, and yet the stars are moving just as fast. That something's not right. And so, in fact, uh, what she discovered is that we had missed most of the mass of the galaxy, that most of the mass of the galaxy is a big, dark halo. And I think I have, uh, oh, I was going to show you a not uh, flat rotation curve. Um, so, you know, we have kind of uh, the solar system, and the sun is at the center of the solar system. And this is the hardest part of the talk for me. I have to remember the names of the planets. <laughs> so Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. I don't, I don't say that one. Uh, <laughs> Neptune, because I'm, I'm going to say it wrong and I'm going to get in trouble. And here's Pluto. Oh, Pluto's not a planet. And these are the speeds of the planets going around the sun. And remember, it, the sun, all the mass in the solar system is in the sun. And so this, this reflects that, that the planets that are very, very far away don't move very fast because the gravity out there is very weak. And if they move fast, they're not coming back. Got it? So this is not a flat rotation curve. That was. And so the idea that all the mass is at the center of the galaxy is just not right. Um, here we go. Oh, so this is what the dark matter looks like. And I apologize for this. This is not so good drawing. But here's the visible part of the galaxy. And this, we call it the dark halo. Um, I know it's probably not the greatest name because you think of a Anyway, that's just what it's called. You get there first, you get to name it. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. And so it's kind of a uh, big cloud of matter that doesn't give off light. That's why we call it dark matter. But it's pretty darn important because it holds our galaxy together. And, uh, and it's really big. So this drawing, if anything, is not to scale in the sense that the dark halo should even be bigger than what I show. It's enormous. It's 10 or 20 times bigger than the visible part. And now I want to come back to the Hubble Deep Field, because this is fun. This, I hope this animation works. So this was the Hubble Deep Field. And uh, the person who uh, first talked about the possible existence of galaxies was Immanuel Kant. And he called them island universes. So he saw these little fuzzy patches in the sky. And they really do look like islands, don't they? But once you know about dark matter, that whole picture gets turned upside down on its head because 
this is not a real picture now. This is a computer simulation of the dark matter. But um, it's, it, they're not islands. So our universe is a cosmic web of dark matter decorated by stars. That's pretty cool. And so let me just, this is a computer simulation, so we can't quite do this for real yet. But, um, and, and just bear with me. So where it's very bright, there's a lot of dark matter. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, where it's very faint, there's not much dark matter. It will make sense in a minute. So you can see that the dark matter forms a web. And if I were more clever with my graphics, or if I'd gotten here earlier and let Ken help me out on this, you know, we could rotate this around. So it's a real web. And there are places where there's not so much, and there's places where there's a lot. And you can see sheets of it and filaments. And, um, but what we see with our telescopes and our eyes are the galaxies. And the galaxies form where there's a lot of dark matter. And so that's where this, where, where this brightness scale really works well. So where there's a lot of dark matter, you get a lot of atoms, and they form a lot of stars, and you can see it. And so this really is kind of a Monet of the universe. So you see this cosmic web. It's decorated uh, by, uh, by stars. And in fact, the, my best analogy for this, uh, Chicago is such a great city. And uh, at Christmas time, I'm walking into the university. And there's trees in the quad, and it's dark at night. And they, they put little lights on the trees. And from a distance, it looks like the lights are just floating there. You know, they look like island universes, to a cosmologist anyway. <laughs> And when you get up close, you realize that the trees are the cosmic infrastructure. And so the dark matter is the cosmic infrastructure. OK. Uh, oh, that was a surprise. Oh, so what is it? Uh, what is the dark matter? And this, again, is you know the guessing game. Uh, the first one, now Zwicky didn't guess this uh, because we didn't know about black holes. But the first thing you want to guess is black holes, right? Because lots of mass, very little light. Everybody, How many people know there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy? You guys are really smart. And how much of the galaxy's mass is in that black hole? Guessing is OK. One millionth. One millionth. So black holes are totally cool. And they're really interesting. And we want to study them. Those who are not good enough to study the origin and evolution of the universe study black holes. Uh, <laughs> don't tell any of your astronomer friends I said that. Uh, but there, there's not that many of them. It's not black holes. Uh, white dwarfs, anybody know what a white dwarf is? That's what our sun is going to become when it's done burning its nuclear fuel, uh, greenhouse gas. No, that's not going to work. That's maybe a bad joke. Dust. Actually, dust is a fun one. There's lots of dust in the universe. Apparently, you know, there hasn't been much cleanup service. Or maybe this is a good, actually, this could be a good argument against intelligent design. If there were intelligent design, there would have been a cleaning service for the universe, and there wouldn't be so much dust laying around. Um, so this is a fun one, because it's easy to tell you why it couldn't be dust. So there is a lot of dark matter in the halo of our galaxy. If it were dust, we, we couldn't see the rest of the universe, because dust absorbs light. Uh, what else? None of the above is the answer. So let me. Uh, uh, let me tell you about another accounting problem. So um, we know how much ordinary matter there is. And by ordinary matter, we mean atoms. And it's 4% of something called the critical density. And if you don't know what the critical density is, don't worry about it. It's 4% of the total uh, amount of stuff in the universe. But the amount of dark matter is 33% of the critical density or the total amount in the universe. So I just want to ask, is there anyone here who thinks 4 is bigger than 33? OK, so we have no string theorists in the audience. Uh, uh, so this is the total amount of atoms. It's 4. And the total amount of dark matter is 33. So the atoms can't be the dark matter. And so that's really, really interesting. Actually, just to to calibrate you on this, if you compare the amount of atoms is 4% of the universe, compare that to a half a percent, that's the amount of universe and stars, you find that most of the atoms aren't lit up. But I showed them to you in the clusters in the hot gas. OK, so dark matter, now we're being scientists, we're, we're being, you know, we're being Sherlock Holmes when you've eliminated the 
impossible. Help me, who knows that quote? Whatever remains, however improbable. Yeah, come up and finish the talk, please. Uh, so it must be a new form of matter. And so let me tell you what we uh, think it is. Um, oh, well, this is another talk. This, this is a full-size model. Actually, the screen here is a little small, so it should be a little bigger. Full-size model of the universe when it was a fraction of a second old. It was just a soup of elementary particles. And the dark matter, we believe, came from the quark soup phase of cosmic evolution. And here's the complete history of the universe. Um, quark soup to us, let me do it in real time. It only takes 13.7 billion years. So the, the dark matter was born in the quark soup phase and came along for the ride. And our universe started as quark soup. The quarks formed into neutrons and protons. Everyone here will recognize the green neutrons and the blue protons. And then the universe was a nuclear reactor and made some helium and deuterium. That was when it was seconds old. Then atoms were formed at 400,000 years. And then stars and galaxies. And here's what we can see with the Hubble. Um, anyway, that's where the dark matter came from. What is it? It's a new form of matter. So we don't 100% know. This is a slide that I made in 1990. And the reason I say that is because um, the story is still the same, but we've made some progress. So um, let's see, what do I have in this picture? The legs of the moose are neutrinos. Has anyone heard of a neutrino? Yes. And so when you say the word neutrino, in front of it, you're supposed to say ghostly. So neutrinos are extremely interesting particles. The sun gives off a lot of them. There's I was going to say a ton of them in the universe. Actually, there's much more than that. There's lots of them in the universe. And if they had a tiny little mass, they would account for the dark matter. And we now know that they have a teeny tiny mass. And so remember, if they had a tiny mass, they would be the dark matter. If it's teeny tiny, then they're not the dark matter. So they're a tiny, they're a small part of the dark matter. So we've eliminated, they're a spice in this picture. And we think the dark matter is a new particle of nature. And there are two possibilities that I've illustrated here. One is called the axion, the thinking moose's particle. And the other is called the neutralino. Now, our focus groups really don't like the name neutralino. And it's a mouthful. But you, we'll have to use it for a few minutes here. So everyone's heard of string theory, right? And one of the hallmarks of string theory is something called supersymmetry. Has anybody heard of supersymmetry? And if you haven't, it's OK. Uh, one of the predictions of, 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 uh, of uh, string theory is that for every particle we know, there's a super partner. Now, just so I can make, a, make fun of the string theorists again, they think that they are making progress on super string theory because they've discovered half the particles that it predicts. Does anyone see the circular logic in that? <laughs> OK. So they predict a new particle for every particle that's already known. And the lightest of those is a particle that would still be with us today, and it's called the neutralino. OK. So this is our best hope for the dark matter. And uh, you know, this is a pretty good story, isn't it? It's pretty interesting. But in science, oh, the axion is my favorite. And I can't tell you why. But um, anyway, I'm the defender of the axion, and I need to give it equal time. But, uh, and I already said this, that neutrinos are a small part of the dark matter. Now we have to figure out the rest. And so this decade that we're in is going to be known as the decade of dark matter. So we have, um, anybody follow basketball? All those Florida teams are gone, aren't they? It's all those teams from Illinois that are left. Uh, <laughs> Isn't Butler from Indiana? Yes. There you go, the Butler Bulldogs. Indiana, that's a part of Illinois. Um, <laughs> OK, so what's really exciting is that, uh, and you're wondering why I talked about basketball. Uh, it is not a mental illness. Um, it, I was going to say full court press, is that we have a full court press on this. Let me just back up two slides here. So here is where we are. It's a new form of matter. This is the most conservative hypothesis. This is the Tea Party hypothesis. This is the most conservative hypothesis. This is the corner we've been forced into, which doesn't mean it's right. 
But this is where we are, and now we have to test it. And so I'm just going to finish up by saying how we're going to test it. So first of all, uh, the neutralino can be made at this very famous uh, accelerator in Illinois called the Dark Matter Factory. Actually, I think it's called the Tevatron. But the, this is the most or this was the most powerful accelerator in the world in uh, Geneva, Illinois. Actually, in Batavia, Illinois, Fermi Lab. And so they were working very hard to turn energy into matter and to make a neutralino, bottle them, take them to Missouri, and convince someone from Missouri that that's the dark matter. So that's the plan. <laughs> okay. So there's a new dark matter factory. This one is in Geneva, Illinois. Or maybe it's Geneva, Switzerland. I always get mixed up on this. <laughs> Have people heard of the Large Hadron Collider? So you go to the Large Hadron Collider. I've been there a bunch of times. You go in the control room, and on the wall, it says, wanted. And the first picture is Osama bin Laden, and the second picture is the neutralino. <laughs> so they really, really, they have about seven times the power of Fermilab, but they're not as smart. They're Europeans. And uh, <laughs> hey, we're exceptional. Uh, uh, well, we got a little bit of envy thing going on here because uh, we could have built this thing and it would have been called the SSC, but that's another story. But So that's one of the prongs. Make it in the laboratory. Make a neutralino in the laboratory. Another prong, oh, here's, oh, this detector is so totally cool. Um, so let's see, a human, do you see a human here? A human would be about that tall. Am I hitting a human there? Okay, good. These detectors are unbelievable. You can only appreciate them by going, them and, going and seeing them. So this is 10,000 tons. It is really big. But there are a lot of things that are 10,000 tons, right? A big old battleship or something like that. It has a hundred million channels of sensors. So it is not only big, it is complicated. And this, these detectors look at the collisions of protons to see if dark matter has been produced. Okay. Um, so we got a lot of dark matter in this room. In, uh, so you can do a dark matter experiment. So we took the, everybody took their wine glass and broke the bottom off to be a gravitational lens. And then the top is a dark matter holder. And in, if the neutralino is the dark matter, then in every wine glass there's about one neutralino. The, and the, because our halo is made out of dark matter, right? So you got to detect it. And these particles are like neutrinos. That's kind of why they're called neutralinos. So they, they are almost inert. And so to detect them, you need a well-shielded detector. And so the most sensitive one in the world is in the Sudan mine in Illinois. Or I guess it's in Minnesota, but that's part of <laughs> Illinois. And uh, it's a very uh, sensitive detector. And these, neutral, these neutralinos are so inert that about one interacts in a kilogram of matter per year. And you got all these cosmic rays and everything. So you got to put it underground to shield it from the cosmic rays. And look at that, University of Chicago. So there's a team. So that's one, two methods now. And here's the third method that's very exciting is we're back into space. And these dark matter particles that are in our halo occasionally collide with one another and guess what? Make something we can see like photons or gamma rays. And so, let's see, where's the one I want to point at? Uh, here we go. This is the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope that NASA put up and named after a scientist at the University of Chicago. And it's looking for annihilations from the dark matter particles. So, dark matter, new form of matter, um, still a mystery. We think we're going to solve it this decade. I told you the most conservative hypothesis, but guess what? We might be wrong. It might be something, I told you the least exciting thing that it could be. Okay, everybody good on that? So now we're gonna shift gears and talk about dark energy. And here we really, we got it, we, people are gonna have to go up and down the rows to make sure you're wearing your seat belts. Cause this, injuries happen when people hear about this weird stuff. They fall out of their chairs and, okay. So uh, this is what Ken was uh, talking about. Um, in 1998, uh, we discovered uh, that the universe is speeding up and not slowing down. And so it wasn't just our imaginations that the pace of life was getting faster. Um, so let me tell you about this. Um, 
It involved two teams, uh, and that's important because science, you know, we, we need to, to have, verify the results. So this is a, a team called the Supernova Cosmology Project, and this is the high Z Redshift team, and so uh, real scientists. Uh, and so uh, let me tell you what they did. So I have to first tell you about Edwin Hubble. Where did he go to school? And did you know that the University of Chicago, I bet no one in the audience knows this, won the NCAA championship 1908, 1909, and 1910. Did anybody know that? <laughs> that is a true fact. See? And it's a true fact. And Hubble was on that basketball team. <laughs> that is also a true fact. And actually, I can't say this in front of Ken because he's the chair of the NASA Advisory Committee, but Hubble's basketball went up to the Hubble Space Telescope. And I, I don't know if I have a picture of that, but anyway, the universe is expanding. This was Hubble's big discovery. Here's our galaxy. Other galaxies are moving away from us. Uh, that's what the arrows indicate. And the galaxies that are farther away are moving faster. Everybody remember that? Okay. And Einstein came along. So this one looks like um, everybody's trying to get away from us, or that there was a big explosion you know, that the Big Bang was here and pieces went flying out and the ones that are farther away must necessarily be moving faster and blah, blah, blah. Einstein actually uh, came along and told us that that picture is completely wrong. The story is much more interesting. Oh, I have to give you a course on general relativity first. Is everybody ready? General relativity in one sentence. Time warps, uh, space stretches. So that's Einstein, that space and time are not static, they're dynamical. Space can stretch. And so Einstein's theory of gravity provided a much better description of what's going on. It's merely the fact that galaxies are sitting here in space and space is getting bigger. Space can stretch, okay? And uh, here we go, I'm gonna illustrate this. We're gonna talk about who's at the center of the universe. Uh, Oh, here we go. Let me, uh, so these are galaxies. And then through the miracle of PowerPoint, you know, uh, I'm gonna enlarge the picture. So now they're further apart, that's space stretching. And then I'll do it again and they're farther apart, that's space stretching. And now we're gonna answer the question, who's at the center of the universe? And of course we know the answer is Harvard. <laughs> so let's watch this picture. Let's watch this picture from our point of view. This is Harvard. Uh, and so there's frame one. There's frame two. So Harvard sits on top of Harvard. And so Harvard sees other galaxies moving away. And there's frame three. And so Harvard sees everybody else moving away from it due to the stretching of space. And the places farther from Harvard are moving faster. Oh, that worked. So let's, there's the University of Chicago. Let's see if it works for Chicago. I'll just line them all up with Chicago. And we see exactly the same picture. Everybody's at the center. And that's because it's the stretching of space. And actually, I prepared this slide for a talk at Harvard. And so uh, therefore, I, have, uh, I had to do it three times because they, a little slow, the idea <laughs> that they're not at the center. So we can just zip through that. So no center, just different perspectives. And the way we describe the stretching of the universe is with this diagram that you first saw on your mother's knee, right? Your mother was explaining the Big Bang. She said, okay, here's the size of the universe, here's time. Uh, the Big Bang is here, the size is zero. The universe is getting bigger, but it's slowing down. That's why these are droopy lines, right? So if it were going at a constant speed, it would be a straight line. And gravity is causing the universe to slow down. And if there's enough stuff in the universe, the universe will stop expanding and fall back on itself. And um, uh, if there's less stuff in it, the universe will keep expanding and slowing and slowing and finally halt at infinite time after the bang. And if there's not much stuff in it, eventually the universe stops slowing and it just, this is a straight line. Do you remember that? Okay. Uh, so you gotta measure that. How do you measure that? How could we measure what the universe was doing way back when to see if it's slowing down. The telescope is a time machine. This is the hardest slide, and so I'm just gonna ask for extra concentration here. So this is called the Hubble diagram, named after Edwin Hubble. Where did he go to school? <laughs> okay. Uh, he plotted 
he graphed velocity of galaxies versus their distance, and he found a straight line. There's a straight line. And Einstein said, oh, the reason you got that straight line is it's just space expanding and getting bigger. Okay. So if we could measure velocities and positions today, we just get a dead straight line and learn nothing. But we can't because the telescope is a time machine. When we look at really far away galaxies, we're seeing them way back when. So let's look at a really fa far away galaxy. Uh, here's its velocity today. Uh, but we're actually seeing it way back when. And if the universe is slowing down, then its velocity should be higher. And so if the universe is slowing down, the Hubble's famous diagram should hook upward like that. Everybody with me? Okay. So it's hard to make these measurements, and that's where these supernova guys came into place, is they used these, uh, they used supernovae, which are the explosion of stars, as standard candles. We all use standard candles. When you're out on the highway, actually it's hard to do anymore, but when you're out on the highway, you look at a car coming towards you, if the lights are bright, is it close or far away? I heard someone say far away. Take that driver's license away. <laughs> so um, if you have objects like the explosion of a star that uh, are standard, then if you see one and it's faint, that galaxy that the, that the supernova is in must be very far away, right? If it's bright, it must be close. And so that's how you can measure the distances on, on uh, this graph. And uh, so the problem is these are really good. Um, a type 1a supernova is the explosion of a star that's about 40% heavier than our sun. That's called the Chandrasekhar mass. Where, where, where was he? <laughs> University of Chicago is the answer. And it's basically a 1.4 solar mass thermonuclear bomb. They're rare but easy to see. And so they used the supernovae to make this diagram. And so these are the data points. And so is the universe slowing up or speeding, slowing down or speeding up? Good. You followed the argument. All the data points were here. And so that means the universe is speeding up. So that's a little bit weird. It made the cover of Science Magazine, 1998, breakthrough of the year. And this is what's really discouraged, discouraging being an astronomer. So to get the biologists off the cover of Science Magazine, we have to discover that the universe is speeding up instead of slowing down. Okay. Well, we got really good stuff. We can do... Okay. Um, that was 1998. Uh, Carl Sagan... Do I have a picture? I don't have a picture of Carl Sagan. Said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So uh, the evidence has gotten much stronger, and I won't bore you with it. Um, but this guy, Sir Arthur Eddington, who, uh, thank you, uh, noticed, uh, who proved Einstein's, gave the first evidence for general relativity with the bending of light, um, had a criterion about discoveries. They should not be too good to be true. Uh, actually, what he said is, no experimental result should be accepted until confirmed by theory. <laughs> So this is a really, really smart audience. When you say this, oh, no, 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 there's a, so when you say this, there are a bunch of people who laughed early, and those are the theorists. And then there's a delayed laugh from the experimentalists. It takes them a while longer to get it, because they're a little slow. Actually, let's listen. Probably about now they would be laughing. And so actually, this is really fun. This is a statement about what science is. Science is not a book of facts. It's understanding. And so if you discover something that you can't understand, Maybe it wasn't a real discovery. Okay, so uh, repulsive gravity is a feature of Einstein's theory. I don't mean that gravity is a repulsive subject, but, you know, and this is the hardest thing to understand because when, when you say the word gravity, your brain thinks attractive. It's stuff that, so, but according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, gra gravity sometimes can push instead of pull. And the stuff that has repulsive gravity is called dark energy. Okay, so accelerated expansion is caused by the repulsive gravity of dark energy. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, I bet there are questions. Oh, this is about the naming of dark. I'm the one who named dark energy. And it's always fun. Science is fun. So we tried naming it funny energy. 
And the focus groups really love that. They said that's not threatening. Usually science is very threatening. And then we said, you know, it's going to take a billion dollars to figure out what it is. They said, I think you need a more serious name. <laughs> okay, let me give you, uh, I'll give you two examples of dark energy. So this is the Zen part of the talk. So we're going to talk about what nothing is. Well, nothing is something, according to quantum mechanics. And uh, according to quantum mechanics, uh, the vacuum is not empty. It's filled with particles living on borrowed time and borrowed energy. Now, this is something that Americans understand very, very well. <laughs> and I think this was the economic plan of at least one of the candidates running for president. Um, and uh, so th this, these virtual particles in the vacuum, you can actually detect their effects. And Willis Lamb won a Nobel Prize for that in the 1950s. And the vacuum is filled with these. And I can prove to you, um, maybe I shouldn't prove it to you, that the gravity of, the va of, of virtual particles is repulsive. Will you take that on faith? OK, why not? And then, then you might say, OK, um, then it just, you know, is, is it repulsive enough to cause the universe to speed up? Is nothing repulsive enough to cause the universe to speed up? Depends how much nothing weighs. Are you still with me on this one, on this? Okay. So how much does nothing weigh? Well, when we try to figure out how no much nothing weighs, we get just about the right answer. We're only off by a factor of 10 to the 55. <laughs> so this is considered really, really good because here we had one puzzle and now we have two. So we have the puzzle of how much nothing weighs and what's causing the universe to speed up. Everybody still with me? I'm, I'm going to bring this to an end here before I get pulled off the stage. So sol solving the cosmic acceleration riddle will require a crazy new idea. That's what's fun in science. Now I put down here at the bottom and I want every person to say this to themselves. Not every crazy idea is a solution to a profound problem. Some are, most are just crazy. <laughs> um, so this, this slide touches me because when my son Joe Turner, who is now a senior in high school about to go off to college and become a great scientist, was age six, I asked him to draw me dark energy. And that's what he drew. And because he saw me drawing with the pens and he wanted to draw with the pens. And what I told him at the time is, uh, and uh, is this, I think, has as much truth as any other idea that we have so far. <laughs> okay, there he was when he was six, really cute. You should see him now. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this one. We, nobody wants to hear about Alan. Um, so here's a crazy idea. This is my crazy idea. There is no dark energy. Uh, we're seeing a new aspect of gravity that when the universe gets sufficiently empty because it's been expanding so long, it accelerates. Why not? That's a, is that a crazy idea? Yeah. That's a crazy idea. Um, it's, a real, it's, it's really nice, but it doesn't seem to be correct. Um, from here, oh, that's right. This is uh, to wake everyone up from here to eternity. Um, this is, so if the universe is accelerating, how come these lines are droopy? It's because you fell asleep. Because your mother went on to say, with dark energy, the universe can actually accelerate like this, not be droopy, but going upward. And until we understand what dark energy is, we don't know the fate of the universe. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a fun one. Um, I'm almost done here. So this is time again. As the universe goes on, matter gets more diffuse. The dark energy stays roughly constant with time so that early on, dark matter was more important. Today, dark energy is more important. And so our universe was shaped by the battle of the two dark titans, dark matter and dark energy. And um, that's important. Um, and only recently did we make this transition, and this transition was about five billion years ago. Is that a clue or is that just a misleading fact? Okay, maybe the most profound problem in all of science today. I went wandering around saying that. And then I looked at the tape, great minds think alike. I saw this tape with Katie Couric. She asked Sarah Palin, what about dark energy? And Sarah Palin says, you bet you, Katie, I believe in dark energy. We can see it from Alaska. And this is something you're not going to see anywhere else. This is her bumper sticker for 2012. Okay, I'm going to skip that slide. I'm going to skip that slide. 
So this science is terrific. And we're learning a lot about the universe. And the story is not over. Stars are only a half a percent. Uh, most of the atoms in the universe didn't make it to stardom. Well, I guess that, well, actually, with American Idol, everybody wants to be a star. But uh, dark matter, 24%. So some of my numbers were a little off. Dark energy, 71%. And uh, this is a slide that my daughter's really, really smart. So I sat her down and I said, look, you know, in our struggle to understand the universe, we know a lot. I mean, I told you a bunch of stuff. I could go on for another two hours. Should I? No. Uh, we know all this stuff here. And what's fun now and what should be interesting to the young people in the audience is we got all the puzzle pieces on the table and we got to put it together. So I asked my daughter, and she's really smart. I said, Rachel, what is this? And she said, Dad, you have an elephant. And um, actually, I drew, you know, I took this thing. Yeah, you got that. Um, and it's really in cosmology. We're like the six blind, you know, the six blind men and the elephant. So we're the six blind cosmologists. We don't really get it. We've identified all these pieces uh, about the universe. And we're trying to figure out the big picture. And it's really, really fun. And so I've given you a little glimpse of what we do. Thank you very much. So. Okay, so now is the fun part where you get to ask me questions and I get to point at you menacingly. Let's, let's start in the front row here. One thing you didn't... Hello? Hello? There we go. <clears throat> one thing you didn't mention was antimatter. What's that and how does that figure in? Okay, so one thing I did not mention, um, and it's, there's so many neat things that I didn't mention that are really exciting and I just didn't have time for. So one thing that was discovered... Um, uh, about the time Hubble was discovering the expansion of the universe is that for every particle, there's an antiparticle. So for the electron, there's a particle that's just like it. It weighs the same amount, but instead of being negatively charged, it's positively charged. And what's cool about matter and antimatter is you combine them and they annihilate into pure energy. So for all, all the particles we talked to, actually we didn't talk about that many particles. So for every quark, there's an antiquark. For every Neutrino, there's an anti-neutrino. What's interesting about our universe is that it's only made out of matter. And why is that? And that's another one of the puzzles. I don't know if I have it up there, but uh, where did the antimatter go? And the story is a really interesting one. We think we started with equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and then something happened in the early universe in that quark soup, and suddenly there was more matter. And then when the universe cooled down, all the antimatter found matter to annihilate with, leaving a tiny extra amount of matter. Now, if you went to an all-boys school when you're an undergraduate, you understand this picture very well, right? So you go to a mixer, there are more boys than there are girls, and so after everyone pairs up, then there's some boys left over, and then they pair up. <laughs> well, when I went to school, that's not the way we did it, but it's now, now, now there is a solution. Uh, how about on that side and then over here? And then we want to get some questions in the back. If, are some of the, the questions that are left unanswered making the assumption that what's occurring in these vast areas of emptiness following Newtonian physics, or could there, something, could there be something else that's going on? So um, let me rephrase. This is like a presidential news conference, so I can't answer that question. So I'll rephrase one that I can answer. <laughs> um, so the question was, could some of these puzzles be explained by bad assumptions? And so let me, uh, that's more or less what you were saying, I think. Is that right, more or less what you're saying? So let's talk about the dark matter, because that's a really good one. That's an easy one. So with the dark matter, uh, Zwicky and everybody since then said, um, we're assuming that it's Newtonian gravity that holds together our galaxy, and that the force of gravity diminishes like one over the distance squared. People know the one over distance squared. So maybe Newton, maybe, uh, you know, maybe that's not right. And so people have tinkered around uh, with modifying gravity. Let's not add any more dark matter. That's too goofy. Let's just modify the gravity. And that's called modified Newtonian dynamics. And that was a really, really interesting idea. That doesn't work. And in fact, um, 
uh, I, don't, I won't tell you why it doesn't work, but it doesn't explain the clusters. It doesn't explain the clusters. And so actually somewhere on, hidden on this computer is a slide that says, if Mond is correct, I will eat my PowerPoint, including the laptop. <laughs> and so I'll say that here again. So sometimes we do change the rules and say, maybe, maybe the real mystery is, maybe there isn't, I mean, dark energy was an example. Maybe there isn't dark energy. Maybe Einstein's theory needs to be modified. So we, tra we, we, we uh, have to try both sides. But I think with dark matter, there are just some particles out there that we can't see, is what I think. And we have a question here, and then we're going to look towards the back. Yeah, my question is the equation of state, the famous equation of state for the vacuum energy. That's going to tell us what, yeah. where our universe is going. Are we, what, what, do, what kind of constraint do we have in that value? Are we getting close to thinking that it's minus one? Oh boy, that was a bit of a technical question, so I'm going to translate that so that I can understand it. So the, the dark energy, the reason it has repulsive gravity is that it's elastic. And that's, well, a rubber sheet is elastic, so that's not so weird. And we can measure how elastic it is with this thing called the equation of state, or we named it after the last president, we called it W. Uh, and so if the dark energy is just the energy of the vacuum, W is minus one. And so once we have something we can measure, we can test a hypothesis. So we've tried measuring W and it's minus one plus or minus 20%. That doesn't mean that it's minus one. I mean, that means that it's close to minus one. And so we'd like to measure it more precisely because we think this is a really big puzzle. That gravity that we thought for 400 years was attractive can be repulsive. And this dark energy that's filling the universe, what the heck is it? I mean, this is a really big deal. And so the handle we have on it is this thing called the equation of state or how elastic it is. And so we've made a little bit of progress but we're, we're, we, we're, we need to make a lot more. So what you could say is right now it's consistent with being the energy of nothing. Okay, just go far one quick. Uh, prospects, though, is it, do you think there's really reasonable prospects of getting that confined, getting that constrained down to a value we can say, yeah, we think it's minus. So the, the follow-up question, which you didn't hear, is what are the prospects for improving that? And that's, again, the really exciting thing about science. I hate to I apologize for keep saying that, but it is really exciting, is that um, we're going to measure it. It's going to get better. We don't know if that will solve the problem. Dark energy is the most exciting mystery in all of science for the following reason. Let me try to articulate it. Is it might be solved in five years. Um, it might be solved in 20 years. It might take 300 years. We don't have a clue. I told you with dark matter, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Ooh, that's kind of a bad, uh, <laughs> we kind of feel like we're close, but with dark energy, we're at the beginning, and it could just take one smart young man, or a woman, or someone in this audience, or it could take 100 years. And those are the best kind of puzzles where you're, where you're, you're not quite sure you can do it. Uh, do we have any questions way is it possible to get one of the people? Yes. Pick one. We have another mic there. Oh, okay, great, fantastic. Yeah, uh, one of your slides with the folks down in Minnesota underground. Uh, would you talk about that the uh, weekly, a uh, week interacting massive particles, that kind of thing uh, that they're looking for? Is it weak, or is it strong? Is it massive? Is it really interacting? And is it a particle? What are we looking for? Yeah, so um, th you're alluding to the term WIMP, which um, I have to, I'm too modest to tell you that I invented that name, but uh, so, and it's a whole nother story. So it's, so originally when we were classifying dark matter being a new particle, I came up with the name WIMP, which was supposed to mean that the dark matter is a particle and that it weakly interacts, that's why we don't see it. And so WIMP is the generic term, and so we're hunting for WIMPs. And the neutralino is the most prominent wimp. It's, uh, and so we're looking for these particles. We're hoping like heck that they have interactions with our detectors other than gravity. If they only show their presence by gravity, how can we figure out what they are? So we're hoping that you know, they do something else. 
And so these detectors in the uh, Sudan mine and other mines around the world, what happens is the WIMP comes in, it occasionally, due to something called the weak interaction, you don't need to know what it is, it occasionally bumps into a nucleus and the nucleus goes moving off with a, little, with a tiny amount of energy and then we hope to detect that tiny amount of energy. And that is really hard to do. And so that's what we're trying to do. If the dark matter only has gravity, we're not going to be able to test this hy the WIMP hypothesis. So we're hoping that it has these weak interactions and the neutralino does. So it's possible to detect it another way because what we're really out for here in science, what science is all about is not just really cool stories, but really cool stories that are the way it is. Right? So when I tell you about the Big Bang, that's not a cool story. We have evidence to support that. That really happened. And when I tell you about the dark matter, we're not quite there yet. The idea that the dark matter is a new form of matter, oh, that's really cool. But we hope in the next 10 years to say that's not only really cool, that's the way it is and here's the evidence. So do we have time for another question? Just one more. One more. How about this young man here? Um, as matter is expanding, is new, is new matter being created to fill the space of the matter that's been pulled away or is matter, uh, for lack of a better word, getting thinner as it stretches? Oh, this is a terrific question. It has to do with the expansion and I can expand this into an hour answer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my sponsor says it should be a short answer. So, um, uh, what's expanding is space. And matter, uh, the amount of matter is not changing and so the matter is getting diluted. But you are a young Fred Hoyle because you asked a really important question. When the Big Bang was first discovered, Fred Hoyle said, you know what, there's another way things could happen. And that is that as the universe expands, more matter gets created, creating new galaxies so the universe always looks the same. Has anybody ever heard of the steady state theory? It is the most beautiful story of the universe ever. And it was killed by ugly facts. So it's a really, really good idea, but it's not true. So, but that's okay. Really good ideas are important. And so uh, your question was a terrific one. In our universe, as the universe expands, the matter's just getting diluted. But it could have been different. Is there a time when it's just going to thin out to essentially nothing? Yeah. So as the universe expands and expands, the matter, I drew a line there, gets thinner and thinner. In fact, just to throw a big number at you that I bet you understand, since the time, the, the earliest time that we can imagine until today, the density of matter has reduced by 99 orders of magnitude. So it has really, really thinned out. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. <laughs>